We are back with another lifting critique session. Today I'm going to break down your lifting video submissions and help you understand all the different areas where you may be able to improve with your technique, with your setup, with your programming and whatever else comes up to help you get better with lifting. To begin with, I want to do a very quick follow up on one of the most popular submissions that came through on the last video, which I'll leave a link to up here in the corner somewhere, which was this squat video with the monstrous knee collapse that came from veggie underscore lifts that sent everybody in the comment section cringing and screaming and saying, oh my God, look at her knees. She's gonna blow out her knees. She's gonna hurt her lower back. She's ego lifting. She better drop that weight down before she bursts into flames. Um, so to just come right back to it, we have a follow-up video, which came a couple of weeks after I gave all the different technique suggestions which I thought was pretty cool because here we have incredible technique, perfect technique for two reps with a very similar weight. So you'll see, yeah, so good. What you'll see is veggie underscore lifts has taken off the little black plates, which are probably 2.5 kilos or five pounds. So she's reduced the weight by, um, What's that? Five kilos or 10, 10 pounds. Total's hard work and pounds and kilos at the same time. Uh, she's decreased it by that. She's got two reps, not one. And she has improved her technique so, so much in such a short space of time. When you see big improvements in technique, or sorry, in strength, when you see big improvements in strength like this in such a short period of time, it can't be that your muscles or joints are that much stronger. There'd be a little bit of progression, for sure. And this first video that she sent through to me, that first video probably did come, probably did get filmed a little bit before the critique video actually came out. But let's say it was a month. Let's say it was two months. You actually can't make humongous progressions in strength in your muscles, in your contractile tissue and your joints. It doesn't come that quickly. Improvements like this, where it's such a big step up, it's going to be from technique. And you can clearly see, if we look back to the first video again, we can see just how much her feet were unstable. She was wobbling all over the place. And that's what I was cueing. That was all, that, that's what I was talking to her about saying, look, we need to worry about how you're placing your pressure through your foot to make sure you're pushing more evenly through your foot and driving right into the ground. And you can see on the second video, okay, I'm glad if you just watch her feet, you'll see very little, if any, movement or deviation. Like you see her totally is up a little bit, but it's very stacked and stable. She's not rolling in. Oh, that was a second. Let's go back to the first rep. Where was the first one? Here we go. Apart from the little anabolic toe taps, the foot is very stable. She's not rolling in anywhere near as much. If we, if we even try to find the same sticking point. So we have this sticking point on the first video, about there. I have the sticking point on the second video, uh, where are we at about that degree? Yeah, we can see a very, very, very different knee position there. Oops, let me pause that one. Very different knee position, much more stable through the feet, much more efficient overall. And this is part of why I was very mindful to not tell her to decrease the weight. I was not mindful to tell her that's way too much weight for you and that's your ego lifting. That's a very easy answer to give. Anybody can look at somebody and say, yeah, you're lifting way too much weight, back the weight off and all your problems will be solved. Or back off the weight, work on your technique, come back to it. Like chances are, yeah, you need to go a little bit lighter to just learn a new skill pattern of how to distribute your weight evenly. But outside of that, I'm very mindful not to tell people that the weight is out of their capabilities because clearly it is in this lifter's capabilities, she can lift it up. The only thing that may have posed a risk was like people were saying, oh, it's cringy, where's her knees going? She's unstable, her lower back's gonna blow out. And the fact is the body's incredibly resilient. There are so many people out there who lift with horrible technique who never get injured. And there are so many people out there who lift with what would be called biomechanically sound, perfect technique, who get injured. Because all the other things that play into injuries are still present with load management, fatigue, sleep, recovery, nutrition, stress, all these things. We can't discount the big role they play alongside biomechanics. But we can't just use biomechanics to deduce whether or not someone's going to hurt themselves. And 
we've got to be mindful of not telling people to always just lift less weight because the results would be, if I said to veggie underscore lifts, drop the weight right back, you can't go any heavier at all because you're ego lifting, she'd be lifting half the weight and she'd be actively getting weaker each time she goes into the gym. Her body would be detraining, deconditioning, she'd be losing her overall strength, which is not good. Not just from a powerlifter perspective, but also from an overall health perspective, because you want to expose your muscles and joints, whether you're a powerlifter or not, to as much tension as possible to make sure that you keep making progress, or at least even, at very least, maintaining. So, I like to get away from this whole fear-mongering that is so, so popular in the coaching and the education realm, to be honest. It's very sad where I see a lot of coaches out there creating fear around lifting when it really shouldn't be the case. We should be trying to empower people and help them understand that there are always ways you can improve, always ways you can improve, but there is no perfect lifting technique. Like I know for sure people are going to come back and look at this video here of veggie lifts and say, ah, oh, knee's still collapsing in somewhat. Knees are still collapsing, it's just gonna hurt herself. And again, I'm not gonna to go too deep into this because I talked about it in the first video, that your adductors are one of the prime movers for hip extension. So hip extension, hip flexion, is when you're in the bottom of the squat here. You're flexed forwards to the hip joint. Hip extension is when you're standing up straight and the hips are forwards in the extended position. The adductors, your inner thigh muscles, they are prime movers in hip extension. They are also, adductors, adductors, they pull your legs in towards the center line. They create internal rotation at the femur, which is, or the thigh, which is what we're seeing here. It's not bad. Many of the best lifters in the world, the most resilient lifters in the world, they show exactly this kind of technique. So we need to get away from poo-pooing that and saying this is bad and wrong and dangerous and understanding that, yeah, it's natural expression of somebody's structure, somebody's unique hip structure, their unique bone structure, their unique mobility, all of these things play into her lifting. And she's done incredibly well here to address the foot pressure, which is the main thing we need to be focusing on. And now it looks fantastic. So yeah, mini rant and little follow-up video over there. Let's take a look now at some of the new submissions. I do also want to say, if you want to submit your videos for my review, you can do so. I'm going to leave a link in the description and in the comment section below as well. So you can just click on through and submit your videos. Um, try to give me a really good angle. It really helps a lot. The better that I can see, you can upload a few videos if you want of the same lift from different angles. That would be great. That helps me see what's going on so I can break things down and give you the best advice possible. While you're there, I would also recommend you check out the free trial to Gambaru Method because that's where you get access to all of my extended training programs, whether you're a powerlifter, whether you're a beginner, whether you're looking at building muscle mass, whether you're looking at getting leaner, whether you want to improve your overall endurance and recovery. I've got at least one, if not several programs in there because on the whole Gambaru platform, there's, I think, maybe 17 or 18 extended 12-week programs, and there's hundreds of individual workouts as well for a variety of goals. And that's just the training section. That's just the programs. There's also all the educational content. There's a full nutrition tracker in there where you can log your progress, and there's a whole coaching algorithm built into it that's going to help you understand how much you'd be eating. It's going to help work with you long-term to make sure you work towards your goals. It's pretty cool. So yeah, you should definitely go check that out. And at the very least, send me a video so I can break down your technique. Anyway, um, let's move on now to Ilya, who put through a video and he mentioned that he's getting lower back pain after every single deadlift session. So I did have a peek through this and there's a lot going on here, which I think is going to be really, really useful for, for us to break down. So sumo deadlift, it's a wider stance. Not a bad first rep. Rep two, I don't know if you saw that. We'll come back to it, don't worry. Different start position. Four. Yeah, that was the one. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's five reps. Yeah, okay. So the issue here, that you can probably deduce that 
if he's only getting lower back pain after deadlift sessions and after nothing else, he feels completely fine the rest of the time, it's probably to do with his technique. There's probably something that he can improve, okay? And what I can clearly see here is that every single one of these five reps is completely different. Let's watch through that again. Well, let's just, oh yeah, let's watch it again. Rep one, it's a pretty decent rep. If you look at it, good start position. Yeah, a bit of tension in the body there, lifts it up really nice. This second rep, hips are much higher. Back's a bit more rounded forwards. Third rep, hips are a little bit lower, but then they shoot up again right before he lifts. Let's have a, I'll, I'll get through the rest of the reps first. Rep four, hips are back up again. And rep five, hips were in the mid range, but they still started up. Five very different repetitions. Now, I know when I see something like that, for sure that there's something we can do to improve the consistency of the lifts. That's gonna at least give us a base start point to work with, and then we can start to address whatever else may arise. Um, but I do wanna have a look at that um, just third rep, just out of curiosity. So that's one, two, Third rep, he starts off in what looks to be like a pretty okay position, but honestly a little bit more of a squat. Look at the amount of knee bend there and how low his hips are. They're almost parallel with the ground, his, um, his upper thigh. And then he jerks up into it. The bar doesn't lift off the ground until about this point here where his hips are already up. So he's squatted all the way down just to jump his hips back up. So the big thing that I'm seeing here apart from the obvious of five different reps, the reason why I'm seeing this is that he's rushing and he's not taking the slack out of the bar. So what I mean by this is for the, for the weight plates, you have the sleeve where the barbell enters into the, uh, the sleeve of the, of, the, of the weights. Now, it's not a perfect fit, or it's not a snug fit. There's always going to be just a little bit of a gap which allows you to slide the plates on and off. What you should hear is that bar clicking up against the weights. That is when you lift the bar up, the bar's got to move up, it's got to click against the weights, and then everything will move up as one solid unit. Now, if we were to turn the sound back on, I normally turn sound off just in case there's any music in the background that would ruin copyrights, but what we should hear, well, what we're going to hear because of the way this is lifting, is you're going to hear the click, that little happen, and then he's going to lift the weight up. It's going to be nothing, click, and then lift. Click, lift. But it's going to happen very much at the same, at the same time. It's not going to be, sorry, it's not going to be click, lift. It's going to be just like this, essentially. Not good. So have a listen. Oh, we'll go again. that pull as the weights come off the ground. It's essentially all happening at the exact same time. Yeah. So you can hear the plates rattling a little bit as he lifts the weight off, but at the exact same time as he's lifting the weights off, the bar is snapping into the inside of the collars. What this means is from a timing perspective, He's just gripping and ripping. He's grabbing that barbell, ripping it all up. What he should do is spend a split second longer to grab the barbell, pre-tension it, lift and wrench his body into a strong start position so the barbell taps very gently against the inside of the weight plates and then lift the entire weight up. So what I mean by this to help give you guys another analogy is he's got 100 and 20, maybe, maybe 130, I think from doing my maths right there. One, maybe 130, maybe 140 kilos on there. Let's say it's 140 or it's 315. If you were to lift, if you were to pull against that bar with, which weighs 140 kilos, if you were to pull against that bar with 139 kilograms of force, that bar won't move. You have to lift with more force than what the barbell weighs in order to be able to lift it up. That should make a little bit of sense. However, you know, if you are trying to lift with 139 kilos of force in this context, that's a fair bit of effort. That's what he should be doing. He should be like grabbing that bar, pulling himself into position, pulling up against the bar 
not lifting it off just yet, but just pulling against it to get his body into that really tight position. And at that point, the barbell should be pushing hard up against the inside of the weight sleeves of the plates there. And then he can think about pushing with his legs, getting that weight off the ground. So I would really be mindful of pulling the slack out of the bar before each lift. Now, what else is going on here? Um, there are a few things, you can see all the different, like I mentioned already on that third rep, how his body changed start positions. I think the simplest way to address this would be to incorporate two techniques. It would be to incorporate a slow eccentric touch and go rep. So actually, no, this is gonna be three techniques. Slow eccentric, so like three to five seconds minimum on the way down. It would be a touch and go rep, not dead stop. You can see here, turn the sound off. He's doing dead stop reps. I'd prefer to see him doing touch and go reps instead, where he does a light tap on the ground, not a bounce, and comes back up again. So three, five seconds down, light touch, straight back up again. And the last technique I'd recommend is paused deadlifts. So I would pause at one of two spots or both spots. Let's start from the start. I would pause on the way up at mid shin there. I would pause there for about two seconds. Then I would complete the lift as normal. I would come down slow and you can do a dead stop and just keep going as is, doing that one pause. Or you could also add in, so we have the pause there on the way up, then he finishes, comes down. You can also pause again on the way down at the same point, mid chin. So a double pause deadlift. This will really help to ingrain the right body position for him, which would be, and it also teaches him how to keep that slack and keep that total body tension in his body while he's deadlifting. So he would start from the bottom here, take a deep breath in, lift up, keep holding his breath, pause here for a couple of seconds, finish, exhale, and rebreath. So take another deep breath in, control this down. Maybe pause here, mid chin, couple more seconds. Keep holding his breath, light touch, very light touch, come back up again. So you wouldn't be re releasing, you'd be just doing a touch and go deadlift. Pausing there on the way up, mid chin, completing the rep and breathing again at the top. It's a lot of breathing, a lot of pausing, a lot to get wrong, a lot of holding your breath as well, but it's incredible for teaching you how to just maintain that tightness in your body and to really think about pushing with your legs and keeping the slack out of the bar. It sucks, but it is very, very effective technique. You can use this as an accessory thing to the main deadlifts if you wanted to. We could also do it as the main lift for a little while, maybe for three to four weeks, come back to your regular deadlifts and I guarantee you'll be feeling a lot better. It'll be feeling so much better, it'll be moving better. Hopefully it'll get you out of pain, but you know, pain is a very complex phenomenon that many things play into. So fingers crossed, but we'll see what happens. So give that a shot. All right, next up we have a video from John Yambo who needed some help with a hip hinge. So I'm guessing this is a deadlift um, video of some sort, yeah. So he needs help with hinging at the hips. Let's see what's going on. Okay. Look, this is not horrible. But So he's correctly identified that he probably needs more flexibility, more mobility, more range of motion in his hip hinge, because you can see his lower back is rounded. Now, again, to keep bashing that same dead horse of not wanting to fear monger, make sure we understand what, what approach we're coming at from technique cueing. Rounded back is not bad. Rounded back is not dangerous. Rounded back is not going to cause your spine to explode or your discs to eject across the back of the gym. It's simply not, okay? Everybody's different. Everybody has different lifting techniques. What this indicates though, for John Yambo's specific technique and structure 
is because his back is rounded, he's not able to, his pelvis is kind of tucked under, kind of like a dog taking a poop, if you imagine that, where it's sort of like rounded under. That's what's happening with his whole pelvis, which is getting in the way of his glutes and hamstrings ability to help with hip extension or pushing the hips forwards. So as a result, what he ends up doing is instead of um, pushing his hips forwards, this is more of a up-down crane motion where he's loading up a lot more through his back and he is still using a bit of his quads as well. So let's watch that again. Just so you can see what's happening there. He's really sort of like wrenching, craning that weight up with his back. He's not able to really think about pushing his hips through. You can really, you can really see it there actually. Let's see if it comes up again. At the very top there, he sort of rolls everything back. Does he do it here? Yeah, that little bit of a oomph. It was really, it was really noticeable on the one, on this one, I think it was. Yeah, he's really like mm, pulling back at the top there. Because he's really using a lot of his back muscles and he's trying to heave, heave that weight up instead of thinking about pushing into hard to the ground and pushing his hips forwards to extend the hip. Those are the two things you should be thinking about when it comes to deadlifting. And he's unable to because of his structure, because of how his pelvis is tucked under like a dog taking a poop. It can't push his hips forwards as effectively. He needs to be able to t learn how to push his hips back into more of like a, I guess a duck butt, Kim Kardashian butt, arching the back away. Although again, you can go a little bit too extreme in that direction too. But to get, I guess, nerdy anatomical, he needs a bit more of an anterior pelvic tilt where he's a little bit too posteriorly pelvically tilted right now. So how to improve this? The first tip that I would give is honestly, stop using those plates and stop using that height. That barbell is a little bit too low for John. If he was probably two, one inch, two inches or so higher off the ground, I know for sure he'd be able to get into a better position with straightening out his back, getting his pelvis into more of that anterior tilt, and he'd be able to work on the technique he needs to push hard into the ground, push his hips forwards. Guaranteed. One thing with people that understand is that the plates, the plate height that I use across all gyms are all pretty much this exact same height, like for these 45 pounds or 20 kilogram plates. And they're all based on Olympic lifting plates, which were designed to be of a certain height for one reason. And that one reason was so if an Olympic weightlifter hold the barbell overhead and they were to pass out and drop the bar and they would crash down on top of them, they won't get decapitated. They won't have their skull crushed by the bar because there's enough clearance from the plates hitting the ground that your head can, for most people anyway, fit under the plates without you dying and being watermelon cracked. That's the only reason why plates are that height. Does that now mean every single lifter has to lift off the exact same height off the ground. If they're not Olympic lifters, if they're not powerlifters, and also understand that we're all of very different structures, different heights, different limb lengths, and even then, okay, there are certain structures that work well for certain sports, okay? I'm short, I'm five foot four, I'm not gonna make a good basketballer because of my structure. Because of my structure, I might, if I had the training for it, maybe well suited to something like maybe gymnastics maybe acrobats, because of my small structure. Not good for basketball. There are also certain structures that are probably better for weightlifting and for powerlifting, or for certain lifts in powerlifting as well, like whether you're more of a bench presser or more of a deadlifter because you've got really long arms, short torsos, long femurs, all these different things play into your leverages and what sports and what lifts you might gravitate towards and excel in. We're not all made to be exceptional at everything. The thing with barbells though, the thing with gym work is that I believe everybody should be training in the gym. Everybody should be trying to improve their strength, improve their muscle mass, improve their coordination, improve their, their joint health long term by doing some kind of resistance training, probably with weights, maybe with barbells. But does that mean everybody should be using the exact same technique in terms of lifting a bar off the ground like this? No, not at all. Like we need to customize this as well because we're all very different people. 
The only people who have to lift off that kind of height are powerlifters and Olympic weightlifters. I don't think he might be. I'm not sure. He might have goals of that as well, but John Yambo is not a powerlifter to my understanding, um, so he doesn't have to do that. So I would recommend come up a little bit higher, and that will allow you to think more about anteriorly, uh, anteriorly tipping your pelvis, and it will let you think more about pushing hard through the ground and extending your hips forwards as you lift. And that should take care of everything. Now, if you did want to lift off the ground, I would still say, lift from that elevation first, or raise up by a couple of inches by putting it on blocks or in a rack of some sort, because what will happen is you'll be able to actively train the right technique with the right pelvic position. You'll be able to train that and get stronger and better at that. And what you'll normally find is as you build strength, mastery, resilience, and joint strength in that one range, you'll be able to start to extend that range further. That's a really big thing that plays into mobility and why I don't do a lot of mobility training or mobility work in general. It's because I know that when it comes to improving joint range and mobility or whatever we classify as that, is if you get strength, if you improve resilience, if you improve coordination in a certain range, there tends to be a bleed over into a bit more of an accessible range. Now there is a limit to this because like eventually you're going to hit a point where you physically can't go further at the joint, where you hit end joint range as well. Um, but for most people, you'll be able to find, just by training more and more and making sure you're doing it with the right technique, you will improve mobility. You will improve your range of motion without doing any mobility drills or stretching or anything like that. Because, hey, right now, in the bottom of this deadlift here, um, if he had his pelvis articulated where we want it to be, he would be stretching his hamstrings. He's stretching his glutes. He's stretching his adductors. They are on a stretch. If he was to do something like isometrics or like extended pauses or slower eccentrics, they have all been shown to improve the stiffness of tendons. They can improve your range of motion. They can improve the elastic properties that you have around the joints and your range of motion. Not by stretching, not by doing extended mobility work and smashing on a foam roll or anything like that, but just by training appropriately within your limits it with weights and then slowly progressing that over time. So a simple one there for you, John, is just elevate a couple of inches. Make sure you're getting that articulation to your pelvis into more of an anterior tilt. Um, so you're not just tucked under like that dog taking a poop. And think about pushing hard to the ground and pushing hips forwards as you extend, not heaving up through the back. Although I'm pretty sure if you go a little bit higher, you'll stop thinking anywhere near as much about heaving through your back. It'll naturally just happen through the change in setup. All right. Um, let's take a look, how are we going with time? Let's take a look at one more video, yeah? Let's go through one more. Um, what do we have? All right, oh, cool. So we got uh, something different. We have a, I'm guessing this is a squat from Mason. 315, 140 kilograms. All right, okay, not bad. I mean, look, the two reps, second rep was a little bit better than the first. Let's watch them again. So I think, I'm gonna watch it again, but the second rep was better than the first. They were both quite quick. We were dive bombing that squat, burying it, bang, deep. Yeah, second rep was a little bit better. Although he had a difference, he had just a slightly higher sticking point and he lost a little bit of his, um, his foot pressure as well. He started to shift forwards. Let's have a look at that second rep. Let's go right back to the top here. Top of the second rep. So uh, we're at 13 seconds just for reference. Drops down. And there you probably saw him shifting forwards a little bit. Let's watch that again. Let's go through this relatively slow. So he's squatting down dive bombing, butt tucks under a fair bit. And not too bad, pretty straight bar path. Now he starts shooting his hips up and here, there to there, he, st he stops going straight up and he starts shooting forward slightly and then he comes back up again. It's very subtle. But you see how there's just a slight change in his direction. Let me back this up again. Okay, it's pushing up. Where are we? Okay. Okay, he's coming down. 
pushing up and then at this point here he starts coming forward look at his knee look at his knees there okay his knees if you look at his knees relative to the logo in the background of the um, on that rack there his knees are in one position as he comes up here oh what's happened his knees shifted forwards more you should think about pushing your knees back when you're pushing up out of the hole okay um, your knees shouldn't drift forwards as you're extending the knee joint because when you're doing that that means your weights shifting forwards watch that again knees come forward on the way down great ah so knees come forwards on the way down which is what they have to do it's a good thing when you come up they should reverse that motion and go straight back his went back then forwards then back cool isn't it this isn't terrible and this is honestly you're going to expect to see some of this stuff happening as you're lifting close to maximal which he is because this is close to a two rep max fair bit of weight there let's go back to the first rep as well what's happening here squats down yeah look at that that's much better okay so he squats down knees come forwards as he pushes up knees push back they don't come back forwards again so he's staying very stable the entire time there is two you can see right down here at the bottom of the squat his heel lifting off he's losing that pressure in his heel and he's deviating more towards the front of his foot and you can also see that coupled with the butt wink his butt curling underneath like a dog taking a poop there yeah and it's just a bit quick overall though this is this is not horrible this is not bad at all this is pretty tight lifting overall um i i personally don't like going too quick on the descent on anything that's just my personal preference um it's easier to manage but there are many lifters out there who lift very quickly they just drop into the bottom of of the squat and they bounce out but they do it really well some of the best lifters in the world that do it lightning fast um, i don't do that i don't teach that i don't think it's wrong it's something that i'm not very good at so i don't like to do that what i do see here though is although mason's doing very well with his squatting he is losing a little bit of that tension at the bottom he's losing this tightness that's why he shifts forwards that's why his butt wigs under that's why he has those ticking points it's because he's losing it at the bottom of the squat there so chances are this speed is maybe just a little bit just a tiny little bit too much for him and he could afford to spend a little bit more time doing some more tempo work so the next block which is going to suck because it's boring and it's painful is doing some more slower tempo work so similar to who was it Ilya deadlifter slower tempo squats and pausing in the bottom pause in the hole here i like doing things like five second pauses when i'm doing strict pause squats between two to five seconds hold up on a position and then drive out and make sure when you drive out you don't do a little bounce and then drive out you come down pause isometric hold push up it shouldn't be coming down pause little bounce that defeats the purpose of the pause in the first place very common error but other than that, from what I can see from this position, because I can't see from the front or the back, which would be helpful as well, because there might be other things going on. Um, but the big thing I'll be working on is just, yeah, tempo. Tempo more than anything else. It's got pretty good ankle mobility from the looks of things. Um, hip mobility is there. Clearly a relatively advanced, intermediate advanced lifter. So you can afford to do some tempo work. It'll be really, really beneficial for you. All right. So that is it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this lifting critique session. If you have any other questions or comments you want to add, drop them down below. Don't forget to add in your own subscription, your own submissions. All you need to do is follow the links and drop it on in. And don't forget to check out the Gambaru method platform, which is giving you access to all of my training, everything else on there. Do that and I'll see you all next time.